I would like to share with you three examples in my life that make me grateful for maps. My first example, when I moved to Provo six years ago, I purchased a home. Although I looked at many homes in the area, I selected one that was somewhat geographically hard to find. I grew up in the Salt Lake Valley where almost the whole valley follows the same east, west, north, and south coordinates first laid out by Brigham Young. No such universal address system exists across the Utah Valley. When, when one changes city limits, the address coordinate system also changes. That fact, coupled with the unusual boundaries of the cities, makes navigating the streets difficult for those new to the area. Once I was settled in my new home, I had family and friends, primarily from Salt Lake, come to visit. The streets in Utah Valley were as foreign to them as they were for me. I would give them explicit but complicated directions to my house, but in every single instance, five to ten minutes before their expected arrival, I would receive a cell phone call asking for confirmation that they were headed in the right direction. I didn't think about giving them a map. My second example. The only magazine I recall coming through the mail to our home when I was a young child, besides church magazines, was the National Geographic. My maternal grandparents subscribed to the magazine each year as a birthday present for my father. He enjoyed reading about the far reaches of the world, and I enjoyed the exotic pictures and the enclosed maps. My parents kept these magazines for many years, which my siblings and I relied on for school reports in pre-internet days. One map of the world my parents posted on our family room wall. I always enjoyed looking at that map, and in my early years, I envisioned myself visiting all of these places. As I grew older, I realized I would never visit all the lands of the earth, but I still had a desire to travel to those I could reach. My third example. A few months ago, my father's sister, my aunt from Rome, Georgia, passed away. Since both of my parents are deceased, my siblings and I felt strongly that our side of the family needed to be represented at the funeral. The only Utah Praters who could get away from other commitments were me, my sister, and my sister-in-law. My father was raised in and around Rome, and all three of us had been there many times. But on all previous trips, either my brother or my father navigated the city and the country roads as the driver. They both knew the territory very well. After the three of us had flown into Atlanta, we realized we didn't have a map. We knew we needed to drive in the northwest direction, but we didn't know the specific roads. Fortunately, a well-seasoned traveler overheard our conversation and gave us verbal directions which we could easily follow in our rented car. Since it was very late at night, we were grateful to reach our hotel without delay. The next morning, the first thing I did was buy a map. Navigating around Rome, Georgia wasn't that difficult, but many of the destinations we needed to reach were outside of the city boundaries on country roads. A map of the area was most helpful in directing us to where we needed to go. Three, these three stories illustrate my gratitude for maps. My verbal directions to my home were difficult because, for people because of their complexity and, their, and the unfamiliar territory. I, the person who knew the directions well, was only a phone call away for clarification or reassurance. The world map on my family's family room wall gave me a much broader perspective of life. I learned at an early age that my neighborhood was but a small portion of the whole earth. The world map also gave me aspirations to visit lands near and far. The third story, the map of Rome, Georgia, gave me, my sister and sister-in-law, specific grounding in where we were, clarity in where we wanted to be, and the route to take to reach our destination. Not unlike physical maps, we have spiritual maps to help guide and direct us to our ultimate destination, back to our heavenly home.
But sometimes we use the wrong maps to major our, measure our progress along life's journey. One such map is a timeline. When I graduated from high school, I thought I would follow the path of most young LDS women. Using a timeline framework, I would go to college for two to three years, meet a returned missionary, be married in the temple, return to school to finish my degree, and then start a family. We would have about five children, and if we were lucky, 25 grandchildren. After my husband retired from his very lucrative business, we would serve admission together and then pass into the next life within six months of one another. <laughs> this was one map I was going to follow, and I did, at least to step one. <laughs> I went to college. The rest of my timeline evaporated. The Lord had other purposes for me and directed me in ways I could not have predicted. Rather than timelines, I propose that better spiritual maps exist for us to follow, namely the scriptures, our patriarchal blessings, priesthood blessings, prayer, and promptings of the Spirit. For sake of time, I will focus only on the first spiritual map listed, the scriptures. One of my favorite sections in the Doctrine and Covenants is section 25, revelation directed to Emma Smith, the wife of the prophet Joseph Smith. Although many revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants were given to individuals, the counsel directed to them also applies to us today. As the Lord has said, what I say unto one, I say unto all. The guidance given to Emma Smith is one example of a spiritual map we can find throughout the scriptures. I will refer to just a few of the verses in this section today. One of the first pieces of counsel the Lord gives Emma is in verse 4. Murmur not because of the things which thou hast not seen, for they are withheld from thee and from the world, which is wisdom in me in a time to come. Emma faced many challenges and was asked to endure many things. My challenges, and I'm certain many of yours, pale in comparison to what Emma experienced. If the Lord counseled her not to murmur, how much more does this counsel apply to us? The word murmur is defined in the Merriam-Webster online dictionary as, quote, a half-suppressed or muttered complaint, an expression of dissatisfaction, pain, or resentment, end of quote. This definition implies that murmuring is not a boisterous, overt complaint, but one that is perhaps stated under our breath or even carried in our hearts. For what should we not murmur? Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, strange as it seems, we sometimes respond better to larger challenges than to the incessant small ones. One can be sincerely grateful for his major blessings, but regularly murmur over minor irritations. Enduring large tests while failing the, small, the seemingly small quizzes just won't do. So what are our minor irritations? Perhaps we murmur about individuals. For example, a roommate who borrowed your shoes without asking, a spouse who neglected to put the cap back on the toothpaste, a neighbor who was slow in trimming a bush infringing on your yard, the office receptionist who couldn't answer your question, the motorist who cut in front of your car, the paper boy who missed the front porch, or the BYU professor who would not give you that one extra point that would change your grade from a B plus to an A minus. Or maybe we murmur about events in our life, such as not getting the English 150 section we wanted, or the apartment we had our hearts set on. 
We might even murmur over more substantial life circumstances, such as not yet finding our eternal companion or being burdened with extenuating family circumstances. Murmuring is not conducive to and will, in fact, suppress the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord's counsel to Emma in verse 10 of section 25 reads, And verily I say unto thee, that thou shalt lay aside the things of this world and seek for the things of a better. In reference to this scripture, President Hinckley said, I feel he was not telling Emma that she should not feel concerned about a place to live, food on her table, and clothing. He was saying to her that, that she should not be obsessed with these things as so many of us are wont to be. He was telling her to get her thoughts on the higher things of life, the things of righteousness and goodness, matters of charity and love for others, the things of eternity. Maintaining an eternal perspective can help us in so many ways. It can even help us avoid murmuring. Many of the minor issues in our lives today will all but disappear in time. Having been in a university administration positions for several years, I have seen this occur over and over and am guilty of it myself. Students, staff, or faculty with small and petty concerns from an eternal perspective, but which seems so traumatic at the time, dissipate and become forgettable the following week, month, or year. Our attitude plays a large role in murmuring. A poem entitled, How Different, recited by Elder, now President Henry B. Eyring, in October 1989 General Conference speaks to this. Some murmur when the sky is clear and wholly bright to view, if one small speck of dark appear in their great heaven of blue. And some with thankful love are filled, if one but streak of light, one ray of God's good mercy, gild the darkness of their night. Returning to section 25, in verse 7 we read that Emma is told, And thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures and to exhort the church, according as it shall be given thee by my spirit. Emma Smith was set apart by her husband Joseph Smith to be the first Relief Society general president in this dispensation. Emma was to be a leader and a teacher of righteousness and truth. To do so, she needed to study the gospel through the scriptures and share her testimony with others. We, too, are asked to become knowledgeable of the gospel through scripture study and to bear testimony of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like Emma's calling as the Relief Society General President, we are all called to serve the Lord in formal ways primarily through our wards and stakes. In October 2007 General Conference, Elder Boyd K. Packer reminded us of the lay ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He said, Everything that is done in the Church is done by ordinary members, the weak things of the world. And then he continued, there is a natural tendency to look at those who are sustained to presiding positions, to consider them to be higher and of more value in the Church than an ordinary member. Somehow we feel they are worth more to the Lord than we are. It just does not work that way. As general authorities of the Church, we are just the same as you are and you are just the same as we are. You have the same access to the powers of revelation for your families and for your work and for your callings as we do. You will have many and varied opportunities to continue to serve the Lord. All of you will be called upon to serve in leadership and teaching positions in wards, stakes, and beyond. The gifts and talents you have been given will be used to bless the lives of many people if you will willingly accept and magnify your Church callings. Just as Emma, we need to rely on the scriptures to help and direct us as we fulfill these and other responsibilities. In verse 8 of section 25, Emma is told that thy time shall be given to writing and to learning much. 
She was to study the things of the world and to devote time to expressing her thoughts in writing. Of what should we study and of what should we write? As BYU students, you are currently and actively engaged in learning much. At least I hope you are. After all, the BYU motto reads, enter to learn, go forth to serve. Hopefully, however, you will not stop learning once you graduate. Learning must be perceived as a lifelong pursuit. Discover ways in which you can continue a passion of learning. Read books outside of your discipline. Discover historic sites within walking or short driving distance from your home. Attend community events such as lectures or concerts. As we read in the Doctrine of Covenants, section 109, verse 8, establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. President Hinckley referenced Emma being told, Thy time shall be given to writing, as follows. Keep journals that you express your thoughts on paper. Writing is a great discipline. It is a tremendous educational effort. It will assist you in various ways, and you will bless the lives of many, your families and others, now and in the years to come, as you put on paper some of your experiences and some of your musings. I have been an inconsistent journal writer. Perhaps that is why I chose to include this in my talk. In some ways, I was more consistent as a young adult than I have been as an adult. I recall hearing a radio report in the late 1990s that as of that day, 2,000 days were left until the year 2000. In my attempt at becoming a good journal writer once again, I committed to write an entry in my journal every day from that day forth until the turn of the century. That way, I would have a guaranteed 2,000 entries in my journal. Once I made the commitment, I began and successfully met my goal. However, I was so burned out that I have inconsistently written in my journal ever since. <laughs> I don't think the goal I set for myself was appropriate because it didn't entail the spirit of journal writing as it should be. Several years after my maternal grandmother passed away, I was assisting my mother transcribe her pencil-written journals. My mother would read while I would type on the computer. My grandmother lived well into my young adult years, and I have fond memories spending time with her both as a child and as a young adult. I knew her well. But the journals I was transcribing took place before I was born. I was touched and inspired by her day-to-day -day activities, particularly the service that she rendered. President Spencer W. Kimball had 33 black binders on the shelves of his personal study when he was called to be president of the Church. On many occasions, he encouraged the saints to keep personal journals. In one New Era article, he wrote, We may think there is little of interest or importance in what we personally say or do, but it is remarkable how many of our families, as we pass on down the line, are interested in all that we do and all that we say. We often remember Section 25 for the specific responsibility charged to Emma Smith. In verses 11 and 12, we read, And it shall be given thee to make a selection of sacred hymns. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart, yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me, and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads. In 1835, five years after Section 25 was revealed, the first hymnal was published. Those five years were difficult times for Emma. She had given birth to twins who lived for only three hours and adopted twins, one of whom died of exposure when a mob invaded the home where they were staying. The hymn book was entitled, A Collection of Sacred Hymns for the Church of the Latter-day Saints. It included 90 hymn texts, 39 of which had been written by Latter-day Saint poets. 
It was common in that day for hymn books to include words only with no music. This collection of hymns was published in a vest pocket edition measuring only three inches by four and a half inches. Emma's charge was very clear. She was to create the collection of hymns and she fulfilled her responsibilities dutifully. What is our charge to be? We probably won't receive a revelation from the Lord as direct as that which Emma received. So how are we to know what to do with our lives? What should be our career? Where should we live? How can we best use our gifts and talents to bless the lives of others? The scriptures and living prophets can provide us direction in our lives. To speak to God, we pray. To hear God speak to us, we read the scriptures and feel the promptings of the Spirit. Let me share another personal experience. When I completed my doctoral work and was looking for a full-time university position, I applied all over the United States. The first serious offer I received was from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. I developed bronchitis on my interview trip. Consequently, I didn't feel as though I had interviewed well. I was amazed when they offered me the position and then gave me a week to get back to them. Now I had to make a decision. In Doctrine and Covenants section 9, we are told not to simply ask the Lord what to do, but to study it out in our mind, make a decision, and then ask the Lord if our decision is correct. I followed this counsel, doing everything I could in my power to make an informed decision. I learned everything about the university and the community, even speaking with local church leaders and seeking out former students who I did not know previously. Although I prayed continually throughout the week, I prayed most fervently the morning I needed to return their call with my decision. I told the Lord I had decided to accept their offer. The Spirit witnessed to me rather powerfully that I had made the correct decision, and off I went. My experience in Carbondale, Illinois was wonderful, but after three years I knew it was time for me to move on, so once again I started applying for jobs all over the country. One position opened was at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I remember thinking, I really don't want to move to Hawaii. But this job announcement describes my skills exactly, so I threw my application in the ring. They offered me an interview and then the job. I again followed the same process I had done previously in order to determine if the Lord truly wanted me to move so far away from family and friends. But I did not receive the same conviction I had previously received. During this time, I was reading the Book of Mormon. I came across across 2 Nephi 29, verse 7, which reads, Know ye not that there are more nations than one? Know Know ye not that I, the Lord your God, have created all men, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? I felt as though the Lord was speaking directly to me. Know ye not, Marianne, that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea? The Lord did not give me the same type of strong confirmation like before, but he spoke to me through the scriptures, saying, if you choose to do this, you will not be alone. I will be with you. That was an answer to my prayers. The opening hymn we sang has particular meaning to me. To me, It did not appear in the first hymnal Emma Smith compiled, primarily because it had not yet been written. The story that has passed down the years is that Charles L. Walker was bored during a very long sacrament meeting and amused himself by penning the words, Dearest children, God is near you. After the poem was written, John Menzies McFarland set the poem to music. Both Brother Walker and Brother McFarland were early pioneers who helped settle Southern Utah. Dearest Children was first published in the Juvenile Instructor in 1877 and eventually found its way into our hymnal. 
This hymn is particularly meaningful to me because the music was composed by my great-great-grandfather, McFarlane. Family has conjectured that these two friends may have composed other hymns and songs together, but none others have survived. At the time I was asked to be a devotional speaker, I was also asked to select an opening hymn. I was fairly stunned by the invitation, and without much thinking, I immediately responded, let's sing, dearest children. Once I began writing my talk, I realized that the words to this hymn correspond nicely to what I wanted to discuss. The hymn provides a map, not unlike section 25, of what we are to do in this life to return to our heavenly home. Dearest children, God is near you watching o'er you day and night, and delights to own and bless you if you strive to do what's right. He will bless you, he will bless you if you put your trust in him. Dearest children, holy angels watch your actions night and day, and they keep a faithful record of the good and bad you say. Cherish virtue, cherish virtue. God will bless the pure in heart. Children, God delights to teach you by his Holy Spirit's voice. Quickly heed its holy promptings. Day by day, you'll then rejoice. O oh, proof faithful, O oh, proof faithful, to your God and Zion's cause. Earlier, I provided three examples of why I am grateful for maps. These physical maps are not unlike the spiritual maps available to all of us. When my family and friends were trying to find my home, I was only a phone call away for clarification or reassurance. We can always reach our Heavenly Father through prayer. The map on my family room wall as a child helped me to see the, my life in a much broader perspective, similar to the eternal perspective Heavenly Father wishes us to take. And the map of Rome, Georgia provided specific direction to get to our destination not unlike the scriptures, patriarchal blessings, other priesthood blessings and promptings of the Spirit. Not only am I grateful for physical maps, I am grateful that we have been given spiritual maps as well. I leave you with my testimony of Jesus Christ. I know he lives. I know he knows and loves each of us. I know he will help guide and direct our lives, if, but we will do our part. May we always keep our eye on the things of eternity and rely on our spiritual maps as we navigate through this life is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.